additional resources outside of potentially your own capability to provide engineering and installation support for your wireless project. And as I mentioned earlier, we have extensive facilities throughout the hemisphere. With regards to wireless broadband solutions, uh, in just about every category that you can think of, we have uh, one or several products. I'm not going to read these out to you. I'm sure you're familiar with most of these. But whether it's licensed or unlicensed, point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint, WiMAX, Mesh, or any of the other popular protocols out there today, you'll find that we have a product and an expertise in each one of these categories. So just a little bit about today's agenda and the purpose of our call. Uh, today we'll, we will be reviewing RF essentials for security and video professionals. We've been selling into the video market over the last several years, and one of the things we've found is that most video uh, integration companies are very good at video, but sometimes get a little bit tripped up when it comes to RF. And that's where a company like Alliance can make a difference. We can provide you with both pre- and post-sales support to assist you with, uh, with specifications and designing of your next wireless network. So a couple of the items we're going to do today, which we think are important, we're going to try to give you a review of the basic terms and RF principles so that when you're speaking to your customers, you have a good working knowledge of our technology. We're going to give you the characteristics of wireless that you should know so that you can figure out where wireless will work and where it might not work. We're going to talk about some practical and proper uses of RF technology when it comes to video surveillance, the video surveillance business. And then we're going to give you a, a bit of a technology comparison between some of the different uh, protocols and technologies on the market today. As I said earlier, Alliance is a value-added distributor. We offer our installation partners a variety of different pre- and post-installation support services. We provide an objective technology source for the latest and greatest technologies on the market today. And we can also provide turnkey RF solutions as well as accessories. We have an extensive network of channel partners across the hemisphere that provide on-the-ground installation support, whether it's on a rooftop or on a tower. So if you're looking like you need additional uh, support and you need additional subcontractors, we have a large community of companies that we can also hook you up with as well. <clears throat> I'd also like to uh, uh, remind you, in our continuing series of webinars, we will be following up this with a, uh, with a webinar with Redline Communications, with, which is one of our premier RF suppliers. Uh, this presentation will take place on July 6th. You'll see an email on this presentation uh, after this one where you can go sign up, and we look forward to seeing you on our next, uh, our next session. Just a couple of guidelines. Um, we're going to hold questions to the end of our session today. We'll probably be about 60 minutes. So uh, at the end of the session, you'll be able to open up a chat window by clicking on that little orange arrow in your uh, go-to meeting screen up on the top of right-hand corner. About midway through the presentation, you're going to see a pop-up for uh, a one-question survey. Um, we'll take a quick break there so you can answer that. And uh, if there's any other questions you have during the presentation, uh, procedural or whatnot, you can use the chat window to, uh, to reach us. All right. Now I'd like to introduce my, uh, my cohort, Andrew Morse. He's our product support manager, and he is an outfishing today. Um, Andy is our prime resource at Alliance for our uh, pre- and post-technical support. He deals extensively with our integration partners and our end users in assisting them with a variety of products as well as design considerations. So uh, this is our first session we've done with Andy. We welcome him and we hope to hear from him in the future. Uh, you'll also be seeing an announcement shortly about a technology blog that we're going to be issuing, and you'll see Andy's contributions on there uh, quite often. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Andy. All right, thanks, Tom. Tom said it better than I think I could have, so uh, that's great. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here. And uh, hopefully on your screen you've got uh, the title screen of our, our broadband seminar series. So basically we're covering off the RF essentials for security and video integrators. The discipline of radio frequency engineering is a lot more complex than our 30-minute webinar, but it's our hope that it'll give you an idea of the many considerations needed to deploy a successful wireless video project. Let me just change this slide. I 
having most troubles here. Uh, there we go. Okay, the topics we'll be covering include radio communications, uh, data bandwidth considerations, and product selection. Uh, I'm, certain, I'm certain you're all familiar with radio, but let's define it. Um, it's a system of communication employing electromagnetic waves propagated through space. Radio waves are identified by their frequency, and higher frequency equals shorter wavelength. When it comes to wireless video, because of the bandwidths involved, which we'll talk about later, we're most interested in the higher frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. This slide is showing two cycles of an AC sinusoidal wave. Uh, the time period is one second, and the number of complete cycles is two. So from this, we can deduce that the frequency is two cycles per second. We use the suffix hertz from Heinrich Hertz, who did much experimentation in electricity during the 1800s. The short form uh, we use is a capital H and a small Z or Z. The example from the previous slide was uh, very low frequency indeed. The frequencies we're most interested in are in the, in the uh, gigahertz range. From the table, you can see that the different prefixes uh, are used with hertz to indicate thousands, millions, or billions of cycles per second. And, of course, the picture on the inside is Hertz himself. I'm sure he'd be quite proud of the frequencies we're able to successfully employ in this day and age. <clears throat> the wavelength. Now, we know that radio waves travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second or 300 million meters per second. We can measure their frequency. Thus, we know how far a wave travels in one cycle by dividing the speed of light by the frequency. This is called wavelength. So wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by frequency. Now, I apologize for simply reading the slide, but there's really no better way of saying it. We use the Greek symbol lambda, the inverted small letter y, to indicate wavelength. When it comes to frequency and wavelength, it is definitely easier to use the metric system, as we'll see on the next slide. So some examples of wavelength calculations. We take the speed of light, which in this case 300 million meters per second, and divide by the frequency, and this gives us our wavelength. These are all valid frequencies, so you can see that the electromagnetic spectrum is very wide indeed. The three examples in the gigahertz region uh, are all used in wireless video and security applications that you may be involved in. Electromag electromagnetic is a compound of two words, electro and magnetic. One of the most basic effects of any electrical current is uh, that a magnetic field is created by the simple act of current flow. In the graphic, the vertical line on the left represents a dipole, or basic antenna, radiating a signal to the right of the diagram. The black line in the vertical plane represents the electrical component, and the blue line uh, in the horizontal plane is the magnetic. So you can't have one without the other. You're going to encounter the term polarization with reference to all antennas. Um, when we're talking about the polarization of the electromagnetic wave, we're referring to the position of the electrical wave. So if the electrical wave is vertical, the wave is considered to be vertically polarized. And if the electrical wave is horizontal, the wave is horizontally polarized. So in our previous slide, because the electrical or E wave was in the vertical plane, the signal is considered vertically polarized. Different radio services use different polarities. For example, AM broadcast radio is vertical, but HDTV is horizontal. Uh, mobile radio is vertical, but radar can be both at the same time. For our applications, we make use of both polarities to really get the most out of our available spectrum. So bandwidth, now this is in terms of RF, not data. It's the way to describe the range of frequencies. For instance, if the frequency range in this example is 5.8 to 5.84 gigahertz, the bandwidth could be calculated by subtracting one from the other, which gives us 0 0.04 gigahertz. Uh, which we generally refer to as 40 megahertz. As a general principle, the wider the bandwidth, the more data that can be sent. For our applications, bandwidth is limited either by the technology we're using or by the rules governing the frequency bands we use. Also, the last bullet point is true, but because one has limited spectrum to utilize, it's always best to use only enough bandwidth necessary to do the job. Although not exactly to scale, the diagram gives you an idea of uh, narrow versus wideband RF signals. The 25 kilohertz uh, bandwidth on the, on the left is typical of that used in low-speed telemetry type radios, generally maxing out at about 9,600 bits per second. Uh, 
the larger 40 megahertz channel could be used to convey 200 megabits per second or more of video data. So this is really what we're interested in. Let's talk about radio frequency behavior. Radio frequency loss. If the RF output signal energy is less than the input, the signal has exhibited loss. A signal that experiences loss is said to have been attenuated. RF cables, connectors, and free space will all attenuate a signal. Attenuation is a reality of life in wireless design. Visible light is simply electromagnetic waves at much, much higher frequencies. So we've all experienced RF attenuation, whether through the pair or by putting on a pair of sunglasses. Radio frequency gain, on the other hand, if the, output, or if the RF output signal is greater than the input, the signal has exhibited gain. RF amplifiers and antennas will provide gain to an RF signal. Now, in the picture, I have a pair of 50,000 watt uh, RF broadcast amplifiers. I thought I'd include this to show the lengths that have to be gone to in the broadcast space to compensate for attenuation. Thankfully, in our case, the RF amplifiers are built into the radios, and we don't need to go to such extremes to get our signal to where it needs to be. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about decibels or dBs, as we refer to them. In our business, we use them to measure two RF powers. dBs are very handy for measuring and calculating large gains and losses that are typically encountered in our projects. Okay, when measuring gain in the system, dB measurements will be positive. Conversely, when measuring loss or attenuation, as you refer to it, the measurements will be negative numbers. And I've got some examples in the slide here that you can see. We've seen that dBs represent the difference between two RF powers. dBms are used to measure any system, typically a transmitter or receiver, with reference to one milliwatt. It's very common. It's a very common reference, and it's much easier to deal with than microvolts and watts, which were commonplace not so many years ago when I first got into wireless. In the example here, I've noted that zero dBm is equal to one milliwatt. It doesn't represent zero output. So here are some common examples that you're likely to encounter on your in your wireless project. Because dBs are logarithmic, note that a 3 dB difference in power levels represents either a doubling or halving of power. A 10 dBm difference represents 10 times the power, or 1 tenth if it is minus 10 dBm. Most of the radios we work with have transmitters capable of 20 dBm to about 30 dBm of output power. The antennas attached to the radio that gain, which as we've learned will boost, out, boost output signal level uh, more on that in a few slides. Okay, let's talk about RF propagation and what can have a detrimental effect on it. Now, RF absorption is caused by obstructions in the radio path. Uh, it's frequency dependent, so that means that not all frequencies can be affected by the same uh, obstruction in this case as others. Uh, you generally counter it by placement of the antenna, perhaps the antenna selection um, with the option is available to increase your transmit power, you can do that also, and also receiver sensitivity. But in reality, generally the receiver sensitivity is fixed, so that so this is not normally an option. Another thing that can affect your signal is reflections from buildings, structures, and even the ground and trees. It can often be eliminated by changing where the antennas are mounted. This will cause what's known as multipath interference, which I'll expand on in a couple of slides. This, excuse me, this slide shows a combination of both reflective signal and diffracted signal. Note that you can indeed bend the radio signal over a sharp obstruction like a building or structure, although there will be much attenuation of it. Generally, you counter this by, the, once again, antenna placements, antenna selection, probably to a lesser extent, and maybe even redesign of the whole system. I did want to note that there are working systems that actually use this diffraction to their advantage in what we call non-line of sight paths. Do they work as well as unobstructed paths? No. However, with newer technology radios that I'll talk about later, they may become a plan B worth exploring. Multipath interference is caused primarily by reflections in the signal path. For example, when two signals arrive at the receiving end out of phase, they actually cancel one another, resulting in no signal at all. In RF parlance, this is called a null or destructive interference. 
Conversely, they can arrive perfectly in phase, and this is referred to as constructive integral. At high-speed digital radios, sometimes the signal is delayed so much that it arrives long after the radio has received the normal wave and interferes with, interferes with the data falling. RF modulation, what is it? While digital signals are used to represent information, they are not used to carry information over the air. Only analog signals can carry information over air. This is done by modulation. So every digital radio is, in essence, a modem, which is a contraction of modulator and demodulator. The graphic shows uh, a signal, basically the modulation at the top, in this case, a sine wave being modulated onto an amplitude uh, carrier. Types of modulation. In the world of wireless, there are many different modulation schemes. However, all forms of modulation fall into two basic general categories. Amplitude modulation and frequency or phase modulation, or perhaps a combination of both, as we'll see. Now, the graphic shows at the top an amplitude modulated carrier and at the bottom an FM modulated carrier. These are two terms you're likely familiar with from broadcast radio. And you may be thinking FM is better than AM because it sounds better on the radio, which it does. However, in our applications, we're dealing with much higher frequency bands where the shortcomings of AM broadcast are pretty much negated. <coughs> QAM, or QAM as it's pronounced, is a modulation scheme that uses both the amplitude and frequency domains at the same time. Under the hood of the radio is basically two transmitters working together to produce a different frequency and amplitude combination during each cycle. In the case of QPSK, which is really four qualm, if you will, it can produce one of four unique values of data per cycle. In the case of 16 qualm, it is one of 16 unique values, and not too surprisingly, 64 qualm is one of 64 unique values. Some radios even operate up to 256 or 1024 qualm, but these are less typical in our applications. So which radios use QAM? Pretty much anything that promises more than 11 megabits per second, uh, of which these vendors are a supplying product today. So Andy, basically modulation gives us the horsepower we need to stuff more bits per hertz, which gives us the higher bandwidth rates that we're seeing nowadays versus in the past. Absolutely, yes. All right, go ahead. So multiplexing, the definition, the act of combining two or more signals onto a single channel. Some examples of multiplexing, <laughs> some examples of multiplexing are uh, frequency division multiplexing and time division multiplexing. There are others, but these are the two that are of uh, the greatest interest to us in our projects. Now multiplexing is commonplace in any two-way communication system, be it digital or analog. Uh, telephone companies were really the first ones to make heavy use of multiplexing, not only between exchanges where several conversations could be carried on a single trunk or T1, but even in the twisted pair line that goes to your house, which allows a voice conversation in both directions at the same time. In terms of multiplexing at the RF level, let's talk about the two most common types. This is the frequency division multiplexing. In this case, each signal utilizes a portion of the available bandwidth, transmits on one frequency, and receives on another at the same time. And you need a guard band uh, between the transmit and receive, basically so that your own transmitter will not interfere with your own receiver. And as a note, I put uh, all conventional point-to-point -point license microwave is FTP. So it's been around a while. So time division multiplexing. Each signal utilizes the entire bandwidth of the common channel for a short period of time, transmits and receives in the same frequency channel but in different time slots. There's this graphic there that shows uh, channel one, channel two, up and downstream. A dynamic TDD is often well suited for uh, asymmetrical data transfers like video. Asymmetrical is where you can have uh, different ratios of upstream and downstream data. So it's very nice. <laughs> The major takeaway here is that uh, based on different different manufacturers do things different ways. They use different modulation techniques. They use other different enhancements 
uh, to get different activity out of the radio. So it's very important on some level that you understand these terms and that you look closely at the different manufacturers that you are evaluating to make sure that it can handle the type of application that you're working with. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. So broadband, what is it? In general, broadband refers to a wide band of frequencies available to transmit information. Broadband allows more information to be transmitted in a given amount of time. Now, historically, data over radio has been accomplished in the VHF and UHF uh, spectrum using conventional 25 kilohertz FM channels. And this is kind of where I started my uh, wireless life as well, so I'm quite familiar with this stuff. These work fine for text-based mobile data, meter reading, access control, digital paging, you know, remote data gathering, etc. However, for streaming video, they aren't uh, really a viable solution. Broadband, uh, conversely, is a term coined in the 1990s to differentiate newer and higher performance communications. I realize it means different things in different industries, but for our purposes, we're referring to signals that occupy megahertz of RF bandwidth versus kilohertz of RF bandwidth, like in the previous example. <coughs> Excuse me. The graphic here is showing the frequency bandwidth we'll encounter during a typical wireless video project. OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, what this is short for. This could really be defined as a multi-carrier system. In one of the previous slides, we saw how by using QAM, you can impose more data onto a single RF carrier. <coughs> excuse me. What OF, what OF, no, excuse me. What OFDM allows us to do is to create multiple carriers, all of which may be modulated at various QAM levels at the same time. The net result is a profound performance gain, which has made it all but the de facto standard in unlicensed broadband wireless systems. So OFDM is a technology that you'll see, well, that you've uh, you've seen for several years in the WiMAX, uh, in the WiMAX standard and in the latest and greatest Wi-Fi N standard. So here's an idealized graphic spectrum example of an OFDM waveform. Note that each carrier is at a, it may not be clear on your screen, but each carrier is at a different frequency and slightly different amplitude as it's being modulated. <laughs> now in practice, we normally see 64 or 120 carriers in use, sometimes more, but uh, once again, for our applications, it's typically 64. So OFDM has become quite popular because of its advantages. It's spectrally efficient. It's not spread spectrum. Uh, great performance against multipath. Uh, it's easier to co-locate uh, radios. And the clear path is not necessarily required for the shorter links. So the footnote there is I put well suited for video and other reliable wide bandwidth applications. This is very true. Now, it's probably a good time to mention that not all OFDM is created equal. There are many lower cost and not so low cost outdoor wireless bridges that make use of one form or another of OFDM, but are based on IEEE 802.11a or G protocols. And these protocols were never meant to be used out of doors. Consequently, they don't deal with the environment as effectively as something engineered to do so. So when plus consider up from the basic variable, which is the distance, from the distance and knowing the RF frequency, we can calculate uh, what's referred to as the first Fresnel zone. So anyone working with optics will be familiar with the Fresnel lens. Now in our case, we're dealing with frequencies much lower than visible light. So what is a clear path to our eye is not necessarily a clear path to a radio wave. In the diagram above, the gray should be gray on your screen. The ellipse represents how the radio wave travels from sight one to site two. As you can see, it requires a much wider berth than visible light. Any encroachment into this uh, first Fresnel zone, <coughs> like the tree, for instance, will result, in a will result in a certain amount of signal degradation. Excuse me, I'll take a drink. <coughs> the newer digital radios are much better at coping in these environments, but it's good to be aware they can cause issues, particularly on longer paths. <coughs> This is extremely important if, if some of you have ever been up on a rooftop at a customer location and tried to go out and site on your own uh, a remote location. 
Like Andy said, it might look like you can see it with the naked eye, but to an RF radio, there are other considerations at play. And it's good that you understand the principles here so that you can identify these things well in advance. We could spend days or months talking about radio wave propagation, so it's clearly beyond the scope of this introduction. However, I've come up with some rules of thumb to hopefully keep us out of trouble. Now, this is kind of Andy's microwave rules of thumb. And so the first Fresnel zone, generally, it's only considered an issue, like Tom said, but it's a longer length. Uh, I use 10 kilometers to 6 miles. Can it have an effect on a shorter link? Yes. A longer one, of course. Line of sight links always work best. That's, a, that's an adage we often hear in the, in the wireless space. Non-line of sight links generally good for a short range and or one large, or going through one large obstruction. Perhaps a row of trees, for instance, is a good example. And higher speed radios need bigger antennas. Longer links require bigger antennas. A single hop, point-to-point -point links can go much farther than multi-point links. All right, antennas. Here are the three broad categories that, that antennas fall into, directional, sectoral, and omnis. We sell lots of antennas here at Alliance, and we can talk at great length about the pros and cons of each design. What it comes down to can be summarized as selecting the right tool for the job. If in any doubt, please engage us and make use of our experience in this area to avoid any disappointment. And then, well, I think you went a bit too far there, Tom. There we go. All right. Okay, I always say that all antennas transmit the same amount of energy. This is true, assuming, of course, they're working. Uh, it's how tightly that energy is focused that determines their application. This slide shows typical gains of the various types of antennas using DBI. DBI is a standard reference for all antennas over 900 megahertz. Although more is generally better, it is possible to have too much gain. This is true for a very short lengths and also where the physical size of the antenna is not practical. If you look at the uh, parabolic dish on the upper left there, you can see it's 28 dBi through 40 dBi. This is true. We have all sorts of flavors, but the 40 dBi antenna will be about 8 feet in, about, in the 6 gigahertz space, so that may be a little bit too large for your application. The important note here is on, uh, you know, some of you folks who might have worked with RF in the past, you see uh, radio manufacturers that integrate antenna and antenna directly into the radio. Pretty much limits you to what you can do with that product, mostly used for shorter distance shots. When you have manufacturers who have what they call an end connector version, which means the antenna is separate, you have a whole different list of options that you can work with. So you can solve a lot of different types of problems that you might find out there. So an integrated antenna might be great for a parking lot, but it's probably not going to be good for a municipal-wide network. Now, are we ready to do our poll question here? This is a first for us, so just be patient while we're figuring it out. Tom's going to tell you all about it. Coming? All right. On your screen, you should see a, uh, a poll question. Uh, what percentage of your projects could benefit from wireless technology? Please check one of the boxes, and we will announce the results afterwards. Thank you. Give me a minute for that, I guess. Okay. Now, quickly announce the results here. All right. So I, I, I believe you can all see these on your screen. So. Uh, uh, looks like the winner is between 75 and 100 percent, so that's very good. Um, so hopefully after today, uh, you'll be able to go out and satisfy the 75 to 100 percent of those requirements out there that you're finding. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your answers.
All right. Okay. Thanks. That was uh, that was cool. All right. Um, how to select the right product? Now, really, the first consideration in selecting transceivers is how much bandwidth is required. In this case, I'm talking about data bandwidth, not RF bandwidth. An example here, we have some cameras local to the DVR and others aggregated at a remote site and backhauled to the DVR controller. From our experience, this is how most medium to large scale installations are designed with a centralized controller. Now, I do realize that some cameras are built in DVRs and some cameras can take input from additional cameras, uh, thus downloading some of the requirements from the medium carrying the signal to the other locations. But these seem to fall into the smaller one, two, one, two or three camera installations only. Latency is how long it takes the signal to traverse a radio link and, in, and this is an important consideration in video. It's also a specification quietly not spoken of in lesser wireless equipment or if mentioned is not qualified as being worst case. The better manufacturers, of course, are quick to point out that their equipment will provide a certain minimum delay even when the channel is very busy. This makes planning a video network a lot easier. You can really tell when latency is bad on an under spec system while adjusting the pan tilt and zoom. So how much bandwidth do I need? That's a great question. Uh, the best we can really do is estimate based on information supplied by camera manufacturer and probably more importantly experience. And as you can see, there's a lot of variables to consider. Now, by the way, this isn't just my personal opinion. It comes from Bosch, and we're certainly no strangers to Ethernet video cameras. It's a complicated matter. Some camera manufacturers won't even tell you how much bandwidth the cameras will require. With the previous slide in mind, you can certainly get a quick uh, idea of required bandwidth when, you're when you are familiar with the equipment you're using. In this example, I took my lab camera and using that per sec determined its worst case bandwidth usage at 1.6 megabits per second. If I were to design a system connecting 10 of these cameras wirelessly, I calculated I'd need about 17.6 megabits per second throughout my, or throughput rather, in my equipment. All right, determining bandwidth on wireless and continued. Most every Ethernet bridge type already operates at less than wire speed. Wire speed being the standard 10, 100, or 1 megabit per second. Data speeds of these radios are generally marketed as over-the-air rates, which can be more than 30% higher than Ethernet throughput. They use one RF channel for both data directions, so speeds are considered aggregate. That was the TDD slide we saw earlier. To confuse matters further, throughputs will drop as a function of length distance. Some radios are much here, much worse here than the others. So a bit of a practical example about determining bandwidth and types of equipment. Uh, every day we get uh, emails sent to us from integration partners. They basically provide us with a Google Earth map shot of, a, of an area of, uh, of a requirement where they need to cover with cameras. They'll usually mark it up, point, on the, point out on the Google map where cameras are to be located. They'll tell us what kind of cameras they're using the type of, uh, of, of SIF rates these cameras need to support. And then like Andy said, we just basically draw this up like we, we cut it up like a pie and we determine how many cameras need to be supported in a specific quadrant of the, of the drawing. And then we select the right type of technology there for you. So if you do have any applications like this, we would be happy to help you in determining the uh, configuration and product selection. Yeah, thanks for that, Tom. Point-to-point um, -point radios. In video applications, these are generally used as a trunk uh, to backhaul signals from many cameras to another location. Now, this is the same slide that I used before, but I just put a circle on the actual point-to-point -point link to draw attention to it. And in several applications, you'll see a use of both multi-point as well as point-to-point. Point-to-point -point is generally used to create your network ring. So you might have a large municipality and you need to get capacity out into the remote location. You can do that with microwave or you can do that with leased or private fiber. So you might have the application where you have both point-to-point -point and multi-point all served by radio frequency. Now point-to-multi-point radios, these are used to aggregate image data from two or more sites to one central location. Now, I should probably uh, point out here, yeah, that these, uh, it shows three cameras and three remotes, but you can certainly have more than one camera on a subscriber or a remote station. 
Now keep in mind that uh, point to multipoint systems don't multiply bandwidth, and by that I mean the bandwidth available at the base station is shared amongst the subscriber stations. The better point to multipoint systems have provisions for controlling this bandwidth, not just to each subscriber radio, but to individual cameras perhaps attached to each radio. And further to our previous slide, the other considerations in selecting point to multipoint systems. VLANs are virtual local area networks. These allow the segregation of all the data streams. Uh, access to devices is still available even when your system is under stress or perhaps being uh, uh, suffering from a malfunction of any description, really. Uh, it's the only way to guarantee bandwidth for video and shared networks where perhaps uh, VoIP or uh, access control or uh, just regular networking traffic is being carried. And it's the only way to ensure that meta metadata arrives intact. Other term, CIR, which is committed information rate, ensures a camera or any device for that matter always has the bandwidth needed. And throttling establishes the maximum throughput of any device, useful for containing non-video traffic, perhaps on a shared network. We've also seen applications where cameras are basically set to uh, 10 base T uh, to perform a crude uh, form of uh, throttling. That's important to note. And uh, the more complex your networks get, the more these terms are uh, come into play. If the radios you're looking at do not support some of these uh, value-added type uh, settings, you will probably not be able to support uh, the video you're trying to uh, transmit at the level that your customer is going to be satisfied. So it's very important that you do some, you know, some pretty deep due diligence into what your radio systems can and cannot do, and that's where we can assist you as well. Right, next slide. Okay. Uh, now the radio has been, excuse me, the radio has been I've been talking about mostly uh, until this point fall into the unlicensed category. I do, however, want to touch on licensed radio because it can offer or can often be the right tool for the job. Now, how to identify applications calling for licensed radios? Uh, any mission critical, any mission critical video application, uh, very high bandwidth video backhaul, uh, unlicensed frequencies are congested in the area you want to deploy. Uh, customer has a dislike to unlicensed product. Um, broadcast applications such as a studio to transmit or link. Um, many high security applications in government. All of these are going to call for a licensed solution over an unlicensed. So in many of your larger uh, networks out there, specifically the municipal networks that we seem to see a lot of lately, you're going to see a need for a combination of both licensed and unlicensed technologies so that you can protect certain parts of the network, uh, primarily the backbone. If the backbone goes down, the video at the edge of the network is basically useless. So it's really important to take all these things into consideration when you're designing a network. I listed some of the uh, benefits of, of going licensed radio here. Um, I know you can all read, but they're worth mentioning here. It's no interference worries. Higher power systems are available. Co-locating future systems is much easier. Uh, there's plenty of equipment to choose from, plenty of expertise available. Uh, wider bandwidth products are typically more popular. Uh, various interfaces are available. If you don't use uh, you know, wired Ethernet, uh, you know, fiber is typically available even OC3 and OC12 type interfaces. Uh, redundant systems also uh, are common. The higher performance allows access to higher tier markets. So perhaps if you're looking to uh, go up market, this could be the option that uh, your customer uh, is looking for. And uh, and the last point, the products uh, easily re optioned for greater bandwidth. That's, uh, that's very true than your products in the license. And just a quick addition on what license really means. Basically, licensing is something that uh, your customer, you, you or even uh, we can assist you in working with the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. You actually, uh, you actually put in an application for a specific frequency. That application gets sent out to all of the other uh, users of these frequencies in a geographic area. If none of them say we, uh, we are on this frequency at present, then that's your frequency, and you're given a notice, and you're given a license for 10 years. So nobody else can operate in that in that frequency between the two points that you specify on your application. 
All right. Now, government organizations are generally exempt from FCC filing fees, uh, but enterprise customers do have to put up a nominal fee to license these links. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that, Tom, that uh, Tom's referring to the U.S., of course, that in Canada, Industry Canada uh, controls the microwave licensing. It's something I'm very familiar with. In fact, it's a service that the uh, Alliance offers to get our customers and their customers on the air. The annual license fee is a, is a cost uh, borne by the integrator's end user, the end user customer. That's something they pay on a renewable basis in, in Canada. My, my apologies to my Canadian brethren. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're all multinational here. So. Now, of course, uh, there are some disadvantages uh, to licensed radio, so let's talk about them. The initial license application expenses and delays. Yes, you can't put it on uh, the air as quickly as you can, the license-exempt product. There are recurring expenses for licensing. Uh, minimum antenna sizes could be too large for the installation. And by that, I mean it's uh, FCC and Industry Canada both, they have pretty much harmonized uh, band plans, but uh, they have certain, in certain cases, certain bands, uh, they prescribe that a minimum sized antenna must be used. So, and it could be as much as four feet in diameter. So if you're putting a link that's going across the street using four foot uh, diameter parabolic dishes, it's probably not very practical. Uh, equipment is more expensive. Um, brain fade on systems above 11 gigahertz. I didn't talk about that aspect of propagation, but as you go at 11 gigahertz and above, then uh, you really have to consider in your link design uh, how much fade the rain is going to incur. But once again, that's something that we can calculate here and do it you know, almost every day for customers. Uh, there's generally greater attenuation on higher frequency systems. So by that I mean basically as you're going up spectrum, there are higher losses. So uh, for instance, a popular band in licensed radio is 18 gigahertz. It's not going to carry you as far as, say, 6 gigahertz or even 5.8 unlicensed in many cases. Uh, relocation calls for resubmission to the FCC or Industry Canada. And conventional licensed radio is FDD, Frequency Division Duplex. So where to find help? Well, here at Alliance, obviously. Uh, we perform a number of services, all designed to make the wireless component of your projects a success. we got some points around here. Uh, path profiles, uh, if you're not familiar with these, this is basically let us know your coordinates and uh, your height of your antennas above ground. And we will let you know what's in between the two. And this is particularly useful on longer paths. Um, you know, let us get involved with it and let you know if uh, there's a clear shot. Link budgets, we, you know, we can determine what uh, the minimum requirements are for your uh, for your project design. Uh, if you need us to design an entire wireless and uh, microwave system, I'm more than happy to help out there. Uh, well, I, like I said before. Um, license applications we do uh, for Industry Canada is quite, uh, I'll be honest with you, it's quite an involved process. It's something we can do for you. And of course, product selection and any accessories that go along with a wireless uh, project. Andy did forget to mention that most and all of these services, except for the licensing services, are free of charge provided to you from, uh, from Alliance. I think that concludes the educational portion of our session today. Uh, we have a couple other things we'd like to do before we let you go. Um, I hope this was informative. Uh, we got a little bit in the weeds there, but we thought it was important for everybody to understand uh, what all these different terms and principles are of RF so we can give you a greater level of knowledge so you can talk a little bit more knowledgeable in front of your customers. If you need any clarifications on any of these items, please contact after the show today. We have a couple of questions here that uh, we'd like to share with the audience. Uh, one of them was, do you folks have some kind of tool to design wireless solutions? If so, how can we access them? Well, there's a variety of different tools needed to do different things when you're designing wireless networks. Andy has several tools that can help you actually in software determine what the line of sight might look like between two points. If you get up on a rooftop, you're probably only going to see about three to five miles at best. And in a lot of our metropolitan areas, you know, with the pollution and everything else, it's, it's sometimes difficult to see much farther than two or three miles. So we can actually plug uh, V and H or GPS coordinates into a program that has all of the built-in uh, terrain data included in that. 
and we can show you between two points what the distance of that uh, uh, link would look like and also what other uh, what other earth obstructions might be in your path. Then you can go back and determine what trees or what man-made structures might be in that path and you can plot them yourself and we can get a real good look as to whether or not we have line of sight or how high we have to be on either side of a link to get line of sight. And as I mentioned earlier, in terms of basic configuration, a Google Earth map uh, snapshot with points on that map identified with the types of cameras or the types of devices that you want to support out there is plenty of information for us to give you a, uh, a basic design scenario and a bill of material of different RF products that you can take to your customer as a basis. You need to do on-site surveys and analysis to provide you know, a bona fide design that you could take to the bank. And we can help you with that. If you're not familiar with uh, performing those types of tasks, we can help you with those by connecting you with other certified installation partners in the area. The other question we have is, uh, is a copy of the presentation available? Yes, we have recorded the presentation and we will send you a link where you can get a copy. Stand by, we've got a few more coming in. Uh, okay, one, uh, one question from earlier today is, what is the difference between Wi-Fi and the products you mentioned? <clears throat> well, the big difference is Wi-Fi is an industry standard uh, it's Wi-Fi is basically propagated into every corner of our lives in the last couple of years. You'll see them on our cell phones, in our tablets, in our laptops. Uh, these are low-cost chipset-based products um, that can provide connectivity, but they come with a lot of limitations. Most of the products that we carry today uh, have some, may have some aspect of Wi-Fi in them, but they have several other layers of complexity that allow them to support the types of applications that you are trying to support out there. So I wouldn't go to a, uh, a buy, you know, I wouldn't go to a, uh, a store on the street and buy a Linksys uh, Wi-Fi router to try to connect uh, cameras up in a network for a customer. Um, that product is not going to have the type of granularity to need to provide a good quality of service. The products, all the products that we represent today like I said earlier, have a little bit of Wi-Fi in them, but they got a lot of other things in there to get the job done properly. Another question is, do you provide design support services? Uh, yes, we do. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we welcome our partners to uh, send us uh, the information about their projects. Give us a call. Talk to one of our account managers. Uh, or myself as well, Tom. Exactly. More than welcome to contact me directly. And like I said, we will help you put together a, uh, a basic design and a bill of materials that you'll need to support that product, not only from an electronic standpoint, but we can also provide any types of uh, cable uh, mounting, uh, rooftop or wall mounts, as well as, as any types of poles or electro, electrical equipment that you might, might need out there. The other item I wanted to mention, if you have any requirements for installation assistance on site, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a vast network of certified wireless installers across the country that we can party you up with and who are glad to work as a subcontractor to you to help you be successful on your product. You know, I'm not going to try to scare anybody here from getting into the wireless business, but you don't want to do any on-the-job training in front of your customer on the first install. <laughs> so minimally, if it's the first time you might have done this, it might be a good idea to bring a certified wireless expert on site with you to assist. Uh, that'll ensure that you're going to have a successful installation, a happy customer, and hopefully a good reference going forward to get you more business. Uh, I think so. The question. Oh, I think I can. I can field the next question pertaining uh, to recommendations for link budget tools. Well, each uh, each each manufacturer has their own tool, of course. Uh, but when we're talking about path profiles and this sort of thing, I use path loss. So maybe that might be what the question was. Path loss uh, seems to be. Uh, pretty much the standard for uh, engineering microwave paths. At least that's what I found. And this is true in the various different parts of the world. But, you know, as far as the link budget uh, tools, there are, every vendor's got their own tools, some better than others. Um, they're all basically dealing with the same known uh, propagation theories and what have you. 
uh, once again, specific questions, uh, by all means, email me, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you fixed up. All right. We will put together a list of some uh, tools that you can find fairly easily on the Internet, and we'll send them out in an email to the group. Any other questions, Lisa? Well, again, thanks very much. We appreciate your time. We're coming in right at an hour, so uh, uh, we've met our requirement. We thank you for coming on. Keep an eye out for the follow-up emails, and please join us in our next session. Thanks very much. Yeah, bye -bye. Thanks so much, folks. Cheers.